You're the hope in my heart, you're the light in the dark. You hold me in your hands, oh most high, oh most high. You're the strength when I'm weak, you're the grace that I need. Your mercy has saved my soul, oh most high. I will sing of your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. You were good, so good, all the time, all my life. You were good, so good. Your love remains, you never change. You were good, so good. And I'm still singing because you are so good. In the flood and the flame, you are making a way. You never let me go. Oh, most high. Oh, most high. Every word you have said you will never forget All your promises will stand Oh, most high Oh, most high I will sing of your love in the morning And your faithfulness at night You are good, so good All the time, all my life You were good so good, your love remains, you never change, you were good, so good, and I'm still singing because you are so good, I'm holding on to your promises, I'm holding on to your faithfulness. I'm holding on to your promises. I'm holding on to your faithfulness. You were good, so good, all the time, all my life. You were good, so good. Your love remains, you never change. You were good so good and I'm still singing because I know you are good so good all the time all my life you were good so good your love remains you never change you were good so good and I'm still singing because I know you were good so good all the time, all my life, you were good, so good. Your love remains, you never change. You were good, so good. And I'm still singing because you are so good. Yes, Lord, you are good. Your mercy endures forever. And Father, we are so grateful for your goodness. And Lord, even if, even if you weren't good, we would still owe you everything because you made us, you created us. But Lord, we know that when the world cries that you're not good, that you are good and you've proven yourself, not only in our generation, not only in our time, but throughout history, Lord. And so we are so grateful for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you share that goodness with us. Um, you give us your spirit. You've given us your son. You've given us everything, Lord. Who are we that you'd even be mindful of us? And Father, as we um, sing this next song here, the first verse of it says, there's a thirsting within my soul it won't cease till I've been made whole to know you, to walk with you, to please you in all that I do. You uphold the righteous 
and your faithfulness will endure. Lord, those are the things that we gather together for, is to be filled by you, to be filled by your goodness, to be filled by your spirit. And Lord, as we worship, may it be a, a sweet, sweet sound in your ears, Lord. This thirsting within my soul It won't cease Till I'm made whole To know you And to walk with you To please you In all I do You uphold the righteous And your faithfulness shall endure I don't know Master of the earth and sky, you alone are worthy at all night. At all night, let creation testify, let your majesty be magnified in me. At all night, you are an endless mystery. Unchanging, consuming fire Lift me up from mud and mire Set my feet upon your rock Let me dwell in your righteousness Adonai, master of the earth and sky Adonai, let creation testify, let your majesty be magnified in me. Adonai, you are an endless mystery. Adonai, Adonai, Adonai. storms surround me speak the words and they will be still and this thirst and hunger is a longing only you can fill Adonai master of the earth and sky you alone are worthy Adonai Adonai, let creation testify, and let your majesty be magnified in me. Adonai, you are an endless mystery. Adonai, Adonai, Adonai. 
thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher. And he shall lift you up. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher. And he shall lift you up. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up higher and higher, and he shall lift you up. Our God is an awesome God, he reigns from heaven above with power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Yes, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Yes, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Yes, Father, we come before you humble and we acknowledge that you are an awesome God. You're an amazing God. And Father, we love you. We come before you eager to hear your word, to look into these uh, passages that we've been going over. And God, I pray that it would fill our hearts, um, fill our hearts with your goodness, nourish our bodies with that spiritual bread. And Father, I pray that uh, we would not turn our hearts away from the hard passages, but that we would Look into them, understand them, digest them. Let it build our faith. Let it instruct us. Let it encourage us. Let it exhort us, Lord. And I pray that um, as we go through this, uh, Lord, we, we ask that our hearts would be ready to receive your word, that the word would fall upon uh, soft hearts, and so, Lord, I also ask your, your blessing, your anointing over Pastor Philip as he's uh, going to be going through this message, and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I want to invite you to join me in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study. I'm going to be looking at verses 1 through 9, and so I'll go ahead and read those, and then we'll go verse-by-verse. Hebrews chapter 6, starting with verse 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, 
and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth with which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. All right, this is a somewhat challenging passage in the book of Hebrews, but let's start with the easier part, starting with verse 1, where it says that we are to, that he was going to be leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. And when he talked about leaving the discussion, it doesn't mean leaving it behind uh, for good, but uh, leaving it for now uh, as he is writing, not leaving behind the importance of these foundational truths. But The idea here is let's advance beyond these. Let's not abandon them, but let's build upon them to become mature Christians. You don't want to remain babies who are only able to drink milk. And we looked at that verse last week in chapter 5. So let's become skilled in righteousness, skilled in obedience, skilled to the point of being willing to even suffer as Christ suffered out of obedience to God. So elementary here means the beginning, the starting point, the origin. But what are these elementary teachings that he refers to? Well, here are the basics. We actually get a list of of six things here in Hebrews chapter 6, verses uh, 1 and and 2. And so the first thing that is listed here, it says about the elementary principles of Christ, says repentance from dead works. Now, we know that repentance applies to sinful behavior. That's breaking God's law. That's the lack of love towards God or the lack of love towards a neighbor. But the focus here in Hebrews chapter 6, as it refers to this as dead works, I believe is in relation to the old covenant system of sacrifices and offerings, as well as religious traditions. Now, why do I believe that this is the context? Well, first of all, the phrase dead works is exclusively found in Hebrews, uh, though I believe the, the meaning of that phrase is found expressed throughout the New Testament in other ways, and also in the Old Testament. But let's look at that, the one other reference. We actually have two times in the book of Hebrews that there is a reference to these dead works. So let's look at, let's Look at the second reference, which is found in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, which says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, something we're eventually going to get to chapter 9 and study this in, in more detail, but the entire discussion in chapter 9 leading up to this verse is not about sinful behaviors, but about the efforts of the Jews to be cleansed from sin through the old covenant sacrifices and offerings. And you can just look at the first verse in chapter 9, which says, then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. So we see that that's the focus was what was happening in the temple. And then if you, we skip down to um, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9, you will see this continued theme all the way through the chapter. It says about these things, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. So you can't be you know, made perfect in regard to the conscience. This is, this 
then leads in, if you skip forward a little bit more back to Hebrews 9, 14, it says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So we can see in chapter 9 that the subject of of dead works is in relation to the uh, old order of sacrifices and offerings being offered up in the the temple with the priesthood and and all of those um, former things of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, but now there was a new covenant. Now, saying that, don't get me wrong, we must repent of evil works, of, of sin against God. But as we're studying through the book of Hebrews, we see that the Jews in particular had to repent also of dead works that they were inclined to hold on to, or they were maybe being tempted to go back to that which could not save them, that which could not cleanse their conscience, like Jesus Christ could through his blood in the new covenant. So the book of Hebrews uh, is not focusing on sinful behaviors um, that required atonement, but more so on how does a person truly receive atonement and reconciliation to God. That's that's the focus. It's not skirting around the subject of sin. It actually is dealing with the subject of sin. But how are you atone? How is your sin atoned for? Is it through the old covenant system, or is it through the new covenant of Christ's blood? And it and that's the focus of Hebrews. It wasn't the old covenant. It wasn't the blood of animals that would cleanse your conscience and reconcile you to God. It was through the blood of Jesus who would do those things. Our eternal high priest who finished his work of atonement once and for all. Now, for for us today, and I'm going to assume that most of you listening to this today are predominantly Gentile believers, and there may be some exceptions. But we don't necessarily have the pressure, um, as they did back in the first century, to return to Judaism. I will say, though, there are some former Christians who have become deceived and disillusioned through false teaching today. They have drifted to the point of rejecting Christ and seeking to be reconciled to God through modern Judaism. And I personally know a family that has done this, um, and I believe the Bible would refer to that as apostasy. But it's rare. I think it's rare to witness such forsaking of Christ for Judaism among Gentiles in the 21st century. But many who would identify as Christians today have sometimes struggled with what is often referred to as, as legalism, as a means to appease God to be saved, it, a, a works-based attempt at salvation. And so there may be some parallel application there, but this, by the way, I think is becoming much more rare in church culture in America, which this church culture today has swung really a lot more in the opposite direction, uh, the opposite extreme of what might re- be referred to as cheap grace or, or hyper grace. And that, that preaches that all the benefits of God toward a person with no responsibility to live out their faith in a manner consistent with historical biblical Christianity. N- now, it's that cheap grace teaching is is a grace taught without repentance. It's a focus on redemption without sanctification. It's about the privileges of salvation without the purposes of salvation. Repentance remains a foundation for all true believers, and that repentance, which means to, to turn, to change the mind, to go in a different direction, you're, you're turning away from something and you're turning towards something. We have to repent of our, our sins. We have to repent of dead works. We have to repent of going our own way. And part of that repentance is 
You need to repent of, if you have your back turned to God, you need to repent of having your back turned to God and you need to turn toward him. And that actually leads us into this second uh, second item on the list of these elementary principles of Christ, these elementary teachings of Christ. And that is, after repentance from dead works, it lists faith toward God. Now, as we think about this in the context of first century uh, Jews, particularly in um, Judea and Jerusalem, didn't the Jews already have faith toward God? So why would this be listed? I want you to remember something I've, I've said earlier, is that faith cannot be understood apart from faithfulness. To remain faithful to God is to continue to trust and believe what God has said, what God has revealed. See, faith is based on God's word. It's based on what God has revealed, his revelation. And God said to the disciples, this is my son, listen to him. Speaking of, of Jesus, this is my son, listen to him. So if you do not listen and follow Jesus, then you don't have faith toward God. You don't have this faithfulness to what he has said, what he has revealed. Now, there's a. let's look at the third thing that's listen, listed here. After repentance from dead works, faith toward God, then it says, interestingly, of the doctrine of baptisms. Notice it's in the plural. Now, and this is referred to as an elementary principle of Christianity. And what does it mean by baptisms? Isn't there just one baptism in, in water in the name of Jesus when we first profess Christ as our Lord and our Savior? Well, that's that's true. There's, there's only one baptism in, in water. But the New Testament actually teaches... And Jesus himself taught about other baptisms besides a baptism of believers in, in water. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 is an example of this. These, this is to Jesus' own disciples. They were already baptized in water, but it says uh, in Acts 1, verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the disciples in Acts chapter 2 experienced an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that Jesus refers to here as a baptism uh, with the Holy Spirit. So they had already been baptized with water. They were already disciples. They were already believers. But this became a foundational understanding in the church that God poured out his spirit upon his, his children. It was, and even in Acts chapter 2, Peter quotes a prophecy from Joel about this very thing in the last days, that God would pour out his spirit on all flesh. So we do see that it's not just a baptism in water, there's a baptism in the Holy Spirit. And uh, here's another example of these different baptisms. Let's look at Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. It says, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on, Jesus, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, this laying on of hands and this subsequent receiving of, a, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it's not specifically referred to as a baptism in the Holy Spirit in this passage, but we know that clearly it's the same occurrence that the 
apostles experienced in Acts chapter 2, which Jesus referred to as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So now we have at least two baptisms that were um, principal, elementary principles of Christ that were taught in the early church and should continue to be taught today. But there's possibly other baptisms that we need to consider. Jesus spoke of his own suffering as a baptism in Matthew chapter 20, uh, verses 22 and 23. And this is when the disciples, James and John, and their um, actually also utilized their mom in this to try to convince Jesus to let them uh, have a place of honor at his right hand and his left when he came into his kingdom. And so it says, but Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. So we see here Jesus clearly talked about his sufferings on the cross, his death for the gospel for us as a baptism that he was going to undergo. And he spoke to James and John and said they themselves also would encounter a similar baptism. So this wasn't a baptism in water. It wasn't a baptism in the Holy Spirit. It was a baptism of suffering. So we have at least three, and there may be even some more things to consider there. But let's move on because we have some um, some challenging verses ahead of us still that we want to leave time for today. So the, the fourth thing that's listed as an elementary principle here, it says, and the laying of the laying on of hands, the laying on of hands. This, we have uh, many examples in the New Testament that they use the laying on of hands for healing, uh, for the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which we just read about in Acts chapter 19, that the Apostle Paul laid hands on them. It was also, they used the laying on of hands to impart authority in the church, to ordain or to commission the elders, the overseers, those that what we would call pastors today. This is regarded as an elementary teaching, the laying on of hands. I will confess, this one baffles me a little, not because... I have a hard time believing it because I actually, I certainly do believe it, and uh, I practice it. The the what baffles me a little bit is that uh, there's very little didactic teaching in the New Testament on the subject. It's mostly the anecdotal stories, and and that's fine. You know, we have anecdotal evidence in the New Testament of these practices. We just don't have a lot of uh, teaching on the subject. For a principle, for something that's elementary and basic, um, it would have been nice to maybe get a little bit more, but I, I guess when I'll uh, ask the Lord about that uh, when I see him. But nevertheless, we have enough, and we know that this is truly a basic teaching, and we need to take it to heart. But let's look at the next, the fifth thing in this list of elementary principles after the laying on of hands. It says, of resurrection of the dead. Notice that in this list is not going to heaven, um, but the focus of the elementary principle of Christ, elementary principle of Christ, is resurrection from the dead, which is very consistent in the New Testament. We've lost sight of this elementary principle, this basic doctrine of Christ has been lost in the shadows of the popular 20th and 21st century emphasis on getting saved so that you will not go to hell, but you will go to heaven. Now, I believe that if you are saved, you will not go to hell, but you will go to heaven. But the emphasis has of, of the resurrection that has been overshadowed by that is a more critical teaching in the New Testament. 
of our physical resurrection from the dead at the return of Christ. This was a focal point that is very clear in the New Testament. So we're not destined to be disembodied spirits in heaven, but to be resurrected whole persons, resurrected, our bodies resurrected, restored, renewed, and we, be, we will become incorruptible in body and spirit for eternity. That is the clear teaching of the New Testament, and it is an, an elementary principle of Christ to focus on the resurrection from the dead. And the last thing listed here, before he moves on, is it says, and eternal judgment. Eternal judgment is a core doctrine of the Christian faith, that there is a day of reckoning and that one day everyone will give an account of their lives before God, before Jesus. Now, this is especially important for the church. Otherwise, if we don't, if we don't understand, if we don't keep in the forefront of our mind that there is a final judgment we may be tempted to think that God doesn't care that people seemingly get away with so many things today, like doing evil and propagating lies and plotting schemes and opposing Christ and even persecuting the righteous. You see, we'll get caught up in those things and go, oh, all this injustice, all of this wrong behavior is, is unchecked. But see, this is the doctrine of judgment, you know, a final judgment. Uh, an eternal judgment, that there is a day of reckoning. And that helps us to be anchored with the eternal matters, not just the temporal matters that often saturate our hearts and our minds as we think that's, that's, it's all about here and now. We will stand, all of us will stand before God on the day of judgment. And as a Christian, we, we will not fear that, we don't fear that day because we have placed our faith in Christ and our names will be found written in the book of life. But contemplating the judgment, the final judgment, not only um, causes us to reflect on our own lives, but also helps us understand the things that are happening around us that, that we see as, as out, of, out of sync with God's order. He is going to bring all things back into order. He is going to bring judgment upon those who... Uh, have rejected him and continue to propagate lies and do evil and plot schemes and oppose Christ and persecute the righteous, all of those things. So in verse 3, as we continue on, it says, and this we will do if God permits. Well, what, what will we do if God permits? Well, we have to go back to an earlier statement where he says in verse 1, let us go on to perfection, and not, not laying again a found, these foundations. These have already been laid. You, you, these, we need to build upon those. You need to grow, uh, grow up. And as I mentioned last week, we talked about perfection and the, the word perfected in relation to Christ. Let me just remind you that Greek scholar uh, Spiros Zodiades says this word means to bring to a full end, or completion, or reaching the intended goal to finish a work or a duty. And here, it's applied to us to go on to perfection, not in the cultural way that we think of perfection today, but this idea of complete, being completed, being mature, finishing the goal uh, to, to finish the, the work or the duty that we have. Now, we're going to move on to verses 4 through 7, and this is, this is a tricky verse, uh, se uh, several verses. So let me read these again. It says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Now, full disclaimer here. You probably already know or have guessed that there is not necessarily a Christian consensus on the meaning of this passage. And I'd like to start with those who say 
that this is not describing former Christians. They're, they will say that they were not true Christians who fell away, but pseudo-Christians, and their falling away only proved that they were not the real deal. Uh, and when it talks about them being enlightened with the truth of the gospel, it just it didn't take root. And they'll go on to say, well, it says that they, they only tasted of the heavenly gift. But let me just challenge us as we think about this. You can't really come to the conclusion, that conclusion from the word tasted or taste, because we already studied Hebrews 2 verse 9. Let me remind us of that. Hebrews 2 verse 9, it says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So if tasted is just kind of this half-hearted, I'm not all in, then um, then that would certainly be in conflict with what it says about Christ, who tasted death for everyone. We see a similar use of the word taste in 1 Peter 2, verses 2 and 3. It says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So this idea of tasted is not uh, some sort of half-hearted, non-committal. It, it, it simply means you have experienced something. So this passage says that they, that whoever he's referring to, they had tasted of the heavenly gift. They had been enlightened. They had become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's consider that. I mean, that's a strong statement that, that they were partakers of the Holy Spirit. Now, don't worry. If you want this scripture to mean that uh, these were not true Christians who fell away, then you can certainly find some theologians and some Bible teachers out there to give you an explanation of how a person can be enlightened have tasted of the heavenly gift and a partaker of the Holy Spirit, and yet not a true Christian. Now, I'm not one of those that will make those arguments, but they can be found. So, I'll give you an example. Let me read an excerpt from John Calvin, from his uh, famous institutes uh, on the subject. And now, mind you, I don't agree with him um, on this at all, but I, I just... I don't want you to think that I'm just making things up when I say that there are theologians who will give their own explanations. I'm going to let you hear his explanation of this. And he actually is making reference to Hebrews chapter 6, this very passage we're looking at. Now, this is from, if you want to check the reference, I encourage you to do that. I've I've just got some excerpts here, uh, and it is from his book 3, Institutes book 3. It's chapter 2, and it's sections 11 and 12 that can be easily found uh, on the internet if you if you uh, just did a, a, a simple uh, search. So he says, I am aware it seems unaccountable to some how faith is attributed to the reprobate, seeing that it is declared by Paul to be one of the fruits of election. And yet the difficulty is easily solved. For though none are enlightened into faith and truly feel the e- efficacy of the gospel, with the exception of those who are foreordained to salvation, yet experience shows that the reprobate are sometimes affected in a way so similar to the elect that even in their own judgment, there is no difference between them. Hence, it is not strange that the apostle, by the apostle, a taste of heavenly gifts, and by Christ himself, a temporary faith, is ascribed to them. Not that they truly perceive the power of spiritual grace and the sure light of faith, But the Lord, the better to convict them and leave them without excuse, instills into their minds such a sense of his goodness as can be felt without the spirit of adoption. Should it be objected that believers have no stronger testimony to assure them of their adoption, I answer that though there is a great resemblance and affinity between the elect of God and those who are impressed for a time with a fading faith, yet the elect alone have that full assurance which is extolled by Paul and by which they are enabled to cry, Abba, Father. But in this, there is nothing to prevent an inferior operation of the Spirit from taking its course in the reprobate. Meanwhile, believers are taught to examine themselves carefully and humbly, lest carnal security creep in 
and take the place of assurance of faith. We may add that the reprobate never have any other than a confused sense of grace, laying hold of the shadow rather than the substance, because the Spirit properly see, seals their, the forgiveness of sins in the elect only, applying it by special faith to their use. Still, it is correctly said that the reprobate believe God to be propitious to them, inasmuch as they accept the gift of reconciliation, though confusedly and without due discernment. Not that they are partakers of the same faith or regeneration with the children of God, but because, under a covering of hypocrisy, they seem to have the principle of faith in common with them. Nor do I even deny that God illumines their minds to this extent, that they recognize his grace. But that conviction he distinguishes from the peculiar testimony which he gives to his elect, elect in this respect, that the reprobate never attained the full result or to fruition. When he shows himself propitious to them, it is not as if he had truly rescued them from death and taken them under his protection. He only gives them a manifestation of his present mercy. Just as a tree not planted deep enough may take root, but will in the process of time wither away, though it may for several years not only put forth leaves and flowers, but produce fruit. In short, as by the revolt of the first man, the image of God could be effaced from his mind and soul, so there is nothing strange in his shedding some rays of grace on the reprobate and afterwards allowing these to be extinguished. Now, that was an, a lengthy quote. There's a lot of w words to explain how this passage in Hebrews is not describing true Christians who have fallen away, but in my opinion, the explanation is actually more confusing and frankly disturbing than the passage itself to suggest that these people that are said to have received enlightenment and tasted of the heavenly gifts and became partakers of the Holy Spirit were somehow given some inferior grace by the Holy Spirit in order to make them think they were saved, only in order to bring a greater condemnation upon them. That, to me, not only is not uh, stated or taught at all uh, in this passage or any other, but it just seems like you can find yourself uh, painted into a corner with certain doctrines and not quite sure how to get out. So, I, I'm not uh, not a fan of, of that uh, perspective uh, by any means. Nevertheless, let's, let's also look at another argument here because there, there is another angle to this where some would say, well, this, the, this in the King James Version, it says, if they fall away. And this is only teaching a hypothetical that is not really possible, like a true Christian can't fall away. So this if, this inclusion of if they fall away is, the, is kind of the exit ramp here to what they believe is a very difficult passage to deal with. Well, the New King James and the King James Version does say if they fall away. But the New American Standard says, and then have fallen away. The English Standard Version says, and then have fallen away. The Apostolic Bible Polyglot says, and having fallen. And the International Standard Version says, who have fallen away. Now, why do all of these and more translation than those read differently than the King James and the New King James? There's no if included. It's stated as having happened. They had fallen away. Well, let me give you an explanation of why the if is found in the King James Version. And that's, that's what I'm reading from. I'm reading from the New King James Version, which has the if. But here's an explanation by Dr. James McKnight. He was a Scottish minister and a theological author who lived from 1721 to the year 1800. And uh, he gives us some detail. This is a little bit, um, you know, more maybe more detail than you are personally interested in. But sometimes it's good to geek out a little bit on um, understanding some of these passages in more detail. So he, he gets a little deeper on this. He says, Speaking of 
these statements, which are the they were enlightened, they had tasted of the Holy Spirit, they had, or they had tasted of the heavenly gifts, they were partakers of the Holy Spirit, and they had fallen away. Uh, he deals with this if here. He says, the participles who were enlightened have tasted and were made partakers, being aorists, are properly rendered by our translators in the past time. Wherefore, fall away, being an aorist, ought likewise to have been translated in the past time, have fallen away. Nevertheless, our translators, who without any authority from ancient manuscripts, has inserted in his version the word if, have rendered this clause if they fall away, that this text might not appear to contradict the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. But as no translator should take upon him to add to or alter the scriptures for the sake of any favorite doctrine, I have translated, fall away in the past time, have fallen away, according to the true import of the word, as standing in connection with the other aorists in the preceding verses. Now, let me quote from Adam Clark, who is responding to this um, commentary from Dr. James McKnight. He says, Dr. McKnight was a Calvinist, and he was a thorough scholar and an honest man. But professing to give a translation of the epistle, he consulted not his creed, but his candor. So, it's admitted by at least one Catholic theologian, in this case, Dr. James McKnight, that the King James Version includes if because it was inserted to align with a particular Calvinist doctrine. And, and he himself was a Calvinist. He recognized that and said it shouldn't have been done. Thankfully, the other translations have not muddled this verse with an if uh, that doesn't actually exist in the original text. So, again, if you want this to mean that it is not possible to fall away as a Christian, you can find a theologian to, to explain it uh, for you in that way. And you're not obligated to agree with my understanding of this verse, which actually I haven't even given you yet. So hang in there, because I'm going to give you uh, my personal take on this. But, I'll, but let me just help you to understand that Personally, I'm not obligated or I'm not beholden to any denomination or any particular systematic theology that, that is going to make this passage more difficult to understand than it may already be. So I am free to uh, read and study this passage without a bias, without a presupposed theological construct that may force me to, to skew the meaning in order to align with some parameters defined by a particular theology. So personally, I, I, I prefer to, that the scriptures understood in their context are what should build my theological understanding rather than saying, hey, I've studied this particular theology. It says I should think this way. And when I come to this passage, it seems to conflict. And now I've got to shoehorn this passage to make it fit a particular theology that I've adopted. So I would I would prefer just to go to Scripture and say let let Scripture inform my understanding, build my theology. So regardless of your personal conclusion to these verses, I do encourage you to adapt a Bible study method which does its best to understand the intended meaning of the Scriptures in their context. And it's not always easy. I understand that. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a good endeavor to say, let, let me do my best to understand what the intended meaning was. And instead of um, going like, well, I'm not comfortable with that, so I need to make it say something else. Now, let's, let's actually deal with this passage, though. And let me give you some, some thoughts on it. It says that something is impossible here. It says, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away. Now, I'm going to pause right there. What is impossible? Uh, it says here, 
What's impossible is to renew them again to repentance. That's the focus. It's impossible for the either the author, if that was his intended meaning, or to his readers, it was impossible for them to do something. And that was to renew them, these people who had fallen away, to renew them again to repentance. Now, in order to understand this, I guess we need to know what that means to renew someone to repentance before we can understand what it means to renew them again, or not have the ability to renew them again to repentance uh, once they fall away, and, and in what way they have fallen away. So, let's, let's think about this. It's impossible to renew them again to repentance. First of all, you or I, we can't make someone repent. But in the context here, as we think about a Jew, the Jews, they could be presented with the gospel of Jesus, the gospel that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, there were many Jews who heard the presentation of the gospel in the first century, and they embraced it. They said, I believe that. I'm going to repent and believe. That was Jesus, That that's what... Um, John the Baptist was preaching, repent, and and Jesus was also taught repent and believe in the gospel. So it's very simple, but you can't make someone repent. Uh, That's not possible to, to even once make them repent, but you can present the gospel, and they hear it, and they, moved by the Holy Spirit, Uh, could repent and repent from their dead works, which we've already seen was a foundational starting point of the Christian faith for the Jewish believer. So it's it's the beginning of those elementary principles of Christ. Now, if they turn at some point later, if they were to turn from Christ, away from Christ, in order to go back to Judaism, it is if they were joining themselves to the crowd of Jews who rejected Jesus as their Messiah and demanded his crucifixion. That's why it mentions this. They crucify him again. And and a Jewish person who at one point embraced Jesus as the Christ, but then rejects Jesus as, as the Christ and goes back to Judaism, which is this warning in the book of Hebrews against that, they're behaving in the same manner of those who, who rejected Jesus at his crucifixion. And it says they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So this is not this is not describing someone who stumbles in sin and is repentant or someone who is tempted with doubts. This is describing someone who has in some way associated themselves to Christ at one point, but are now disassociating themselves from him in order to go back to Judaism. Now, this is not teaching that they can't repent of that and return to Christ. It, what it says, it's impossible for you to renew them again to repentance. What, how are we to understand that? Well, if a Jewish person heard the gospel and repented of their dead works, and they believed in Christ, and they were baptized, and they began their new life in Christ, but then they repent of repenting, and they go back to Judaism, there is not not another Christ available. There, there, there's not, you know, there's not a second Christ. There's not a third Christ. There's, there's only one Christ. There's not another gospel message of repentance other than the one they have already heard and now have rejected. There's no other angle that you can use to convict or to compel them to, to say that, um, you know, that, you can, how are you going to renew them again? This is, let me just use a par, um, a parallel here that I believe. To say it's impossible for you to renew them again is likely comparable to when Jesus taught about rich, the rich entering the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 23, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easy, easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, 
They were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So we see there are things that are impossible for us, that are possible for God. So in this passage in Hebrews chapter 6, it is saying something that's impossible for us to do. It's impossible for you to renew again to repentance in this, in this context, a Jewish person who once professed Christ but then rejects Christ in order to return to Judaism. Why is it impossible? Because there's no plan B that you can offer to them if they reject Christ. There's no gospel 2.0 to offer. And yet, let's remember, though you might not be able to do that, um, with God, all things are possible. God could actually convict them and, and bring them back. The Old Testament, by the way, is, is full of passages, especially in the prophets, of God calling out to Jewish backsliders. He actually refers to it as backsliding and calling out to them to return to him. Even, even when they were in their most um, lost state uh, in rebellion against God, he still pursued them. He still called them to come back. The Apostle Paul speaking about Jewish people who were broken off of what he refers to as the olive tree because of unbelief in Christ, also said in Romans chapter 11, verse 23, it says, and they also, speaking of these Jews, that because of unbelief belief had been broken off, it says, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. So, I hope that helps you understand this challenging verse a little more. There, could, there definitely could be a lot more said. We kind of limited time on a, on a uh, Sunday morning sermon. But let's look at a, the cultivation analogy that's given right after this, which is tied to this challenging verse. It says, verse 7, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So how does this apply to this passage about those that have fallen away? Well, the analogy here is, I believe, drawing from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, which is uh, one of these prophecies about God cultivating his vineyard, which is specifically referred to in that prophecy as Israel. He nurtured his vineyard and expected good fruit from it. Let me read, starting with Isaiah 5, verse 4, and how this um, this appeal from God ends. And you'll notice there's um, some tie-in here, with especially when, you, when we look at in Hebrews, it talks about the um, the thorns and the briars instead of, you know, God's looking for good fruit and instead he's getting thorns and briars, which is in reference, by the way, to the fact that the gospel had gone out to the Jews. And in this case, some having, um, at least we the if we understand this correctly, had believed, but now out of pressure were um, tempted and some even going back to Judaism, that's not the fruit that God was looking at. He's referring to that as thorns and briars, which are um, is not good. So back to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 4, it says, and this is God speaking, what more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. So the author of Hebrews is drawing a parallel between uh, 
what he is describing about Jews who fall away in this parable in, from Isaiah. We won't, we won't, I won't read it, but Jesus also gave a parable of, a, of the vineyard, which was also based upon Isaiah 5, which you can find in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 45. It's a parable about Jews rejecting Jesus as their Messiah, their, their King. But let's end on a positive note. And I intended this so that we could um, have some hope here and not just uh, be kind of just looking at this foreboding. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9, it says, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. So the author of Hebrews recognizes that, yes, I'm speaking some very hard, some very heavy things that could be weighing heavy on your shoulders here. But he says, I want you to have courage here. He says, he calls them beloved. They're true Christians. He says, I'm confident of better things concerning you, the things that accompany salvation. You see, but the warnings are real. The potential bad news does not have to be the prevailing story of our lives. And as I think about, you know, I'm a parent, I've got four children, and I've got a couple grandchildren now. And when our children were young, if you're a parent and your children are young, and we warn them to stay away from the street, this is a common warning. Um, and in fact, even recently, my, my oldest daughter and my son-in-law were over with my grandkids, and they were out in the front yard, and we're along a, uh, a road that is sometimes busy, sometimes not. And, you know, the classic warning came forth from, you know, my son-in-law to his daughter for her to stay away from the road. This, these are real warnings that we give to children for their safety. It's not some facade. It's not some empty, pointless exercise of futility. Um, but when we give those warnings, we don't expect our children to get hit by a car and die or be maimed for life, we can say with this verse, we're confident of better things concerning you because we know you're going to hear, you're going to listen to these instructions, and you're going to follow these instructions to stay out of the street. Now, do children sometimes wander out into a road and get hit? Most likely, though I'm in, in my years, 48 years of of life. I've never personally known a family who experienced that, but I do know that it does happen. But it, but I believe it's, and, and hopefully it's rare. But let's close with these encouraging words. Beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. So I hope that encourages you as we continue in our book in the book of Hebrews there are some other pa challenging passages ahead but this is one of the more difficult ones so if we can get through this with flying colors uh, it's kind of smooth sailing from here so we'll uh, look forward to joining you again next week God bless mm -hmm.
I will shout You are worthy of praise In the morning, in the evening At the end of all days I will sing, I will shout Thank you for ministering to our hearts, Lord, through the time of worship, through the message. And God, I pray that as we go about our week, that we would not just um, rely upon worshiping on just Sunday, but that we would be worshiping on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, every day of the week, Lord, that we would be honoring to you, that we'd be glorifying to you, that we'd be seeking your will daily, that we would be doing your will. And Lord, that our faith would be working through love and that we would be manifesting the gifts, the callings that you have entrusted with us. Lord, that we would be fruitful in your kingdom. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>